Hello everyone, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today, um, albeit um, online only. It's such a pleasure um, to have you. Um, thanks so much for making it and thanks everyone um, who is listening in. Now, in this panel, we are dealing essentially with the triple crisis that everyone has been talking about for the past year or so. It's the climate, biodiversity and of course health crisis. Um, you add the layer of social inequality and you're in for, well, a perfect storm. Now, actually, obviously, the PGS is about finding solutions to all of this. And I would love to dedicate um, this panel to a solutions agenda for the 2020s. So, um, without any further ado, let me introduce um, the panelists to you. Um, I start with um, Richard Lockhead, and I understand that, uh, Richard, you need to leave in about 15 minutes because uh, you've got a day job to do. Uh, so uh, we need to prioritise uh, your time as well. So you've been a politician in Scotland uh, since 1999. You were a cabinet secretary for rural affairs, food and the environment in the Scottish government between 27 and uh, 2016. You were then Minister for Further Education and Higher Education and Science. And finally, now you are the Minister for Just Transition, Employment and Fair Work. You have been in this position since May 2021. And uh, before I introduce very briefly the other panellists, um, I already want to tell you what I would love to ask you in just a minute. And that's um, your personal experiences in your day-to-day -day work. How do you implement a Just Transition um, in Scotland? We've got... Um, According to our choreography, um, Ellen Übersher um, speaking first. Uh, she's going to set the scene for us. She is uh, the co-president of the Heinrich Bell Foundation, has been in this position since uh, 2017. So um, just in the interest of time, before um, coming to the other wonderful two panelists, I would love to give the floor um, to Ellen for a little bit of a scene setting statement and then I hand over uh, to Richard. So um, over to you, Ellen. Yeah, thank you very much. Unfortunately, uh, due to technical problems, I'm only there per uh, telephone. Uh, but I think for the moment this uh, will do. Um, looking at the lots of vaccinated Europeans and uh, in a few months, I think the crisis, uh, this crisis will be over, not to mention other crises. Yeah, as a today scene setter, I would like to bring three major theses into the discussion. Um, the first, climate protection for all is a democratic and a social matter. The fact that preserving the livelihood of citizens is a democratic issue was highlighted by a verdict of the German Constitutional Court in March 2021. This is quite unique. The more climate change has exacerbated the inequalities for marginalized, marginalized groups that have already faced sexism, racism, or other forms of social injustices. Meanwhile, right-wing populist groups, we spoke about this uh, yesterday, capture the issue of climate change to counter science and international community with nationalistic and isol uh, isolationist responses. It makes clear an environmental transformation has to go hand in hand with a social transformation that takes all people into account equally. And this requires a strong alliance between democracies and an alliance that shares the same values of freedom and justice. This was first. The second point, a green and equitable renewable or renewal can only work as a transatlantic project. The EU and the US share the goal of climate neutrality by 2050 since Biden administration is at work. While both plans, the Build Back Better, Better Plan we've seen and the European Green Deal, on the other hand, have initiated reforms including comprehensive investment plans, decarbonizing the energy sector or promoting green technologies, they have so far worked on their own, especially the EU's contribution to strengthening a transatlantic climate partnership has been hesitant towards the U.S. For a joint climate agenda, it will take a progressive European transatlantic climate alliance that brings democracies together 
and establishes new standards in the area of climate protection, such as a climate neutral transatlantic zone with common ecological, social and economic standards, a common carbon tax or revitalizing the US EU Energy Council, with, which has been in place but uh, was, uh, uh, didn't, uh, didn't take place during the Trump administration. Or another idea would be to establish um, a clean energy bank in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to have means, financial means, to finance new te green technology. Second point. The third point, citizens and civil society have to be involved in shaping the Green Deal. Communities, local initiatives and civil society are placed exactly where transformation happens and hence present important drivers of, present important drivers of environmental, social and economic renewal. And bringing Build Back Better and the EU Green Deal together Will, be, become a, will, will become a success story only if it is established within a broad alliance of civil society, of economy, of science and trade unions that has their say in how to shape a sustainable and green renewal. We saw this in Germany when uh, communities and citizens participated in the energy transition and became shareholders Uh, of, of wind energy, and this gave the, the whole transition a real boost. So this is um, a concept of success. Involving climate activists or establishing citizens' council are only two opportunities of systematically involving civil society in the political process, and in the end, it will strengthen our democracies as well, because democracy then delivered what it is uh, yeah what it's uh, uh, what it's made for or what what is established for to guarantee freedom and freedom and justice okay i would uh, in, in the interest of um, of our dialogue i would like to end here and looking forward to the per other perspectives of other participants here and i hope i'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion thank you Excellent. Thanks so much, um, Ellen. We will come back to a few um, points you raised uh, during the debate. You mentioned transatlantic relations. Uh, of course, someone from the US here today. Uh, you mentioned civil society. Um, I'm sure we can tackle that as well. But now I would like to hand over um, to Richard and ask you, um, yeah, as I said in the beginning, what does a minister for just transition do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, but also, more specifically, um, What does the Scottish government do using public funds to bring about this green and just future that citizens demand? And if I could just ask you um, to stop maybe two minutes before you need to go, because then I get the chance to ask you a follow-up question as well. Over to you. Guten Tag from Scotland's Parliament and Scotland. Mm -hmm. I've just moved into my new ministerial office, so there's no books behind me in the bookshelf. But it's really nice to join you all today. Uh, I am Scotland's first ever Minister for Just Transition, but I also have responsibility for, for employability, employment, and fair work, the fair work agenda we have here in Scotland, which I'll, I'll tell you about as well, because it's very closely linked to what we're talking about today. So my job as Minister for Just Transition in the, the Scottish Government and Parliament is that as we move in Scotland towards our ambitious target, of being a net zero society by 2045, that we plan for that future and that we do so ensuring there's fairness and prosperity for all people in Scotland uh, as we go towards that new future and transform our economy going forward. Um, in Scotland, we had a situation many years ago where we closed the coal mines, or at least they were closed. We didn't close them ourselves. And many people were put out of work very quickly. And many of our communities today still suffer the scars of those closures in terms of, you know, there was a lack of replacement jobs and uh, there was a, you know, resulting poverty and deprivation in some areas. We don't want to go through that again as we go through economic transformation. So that's my job as Just Transitions Minister is to make sure we plan for the future. And I work across government so my job is to speak to all the ministers across government and cabinet secretaries 
to make sure that at the heart of all their plans is a just transition. So in terms of making sure we're creating green jobs, but not only green jobs, but good quality jobs as well, good jobs. And that's why I also have responsibility for fair work, which is one of our flagship policies in Scotland, whereby we want people in Scotland to have rewarding, uh, self-fulfilling employment, and therefore tackling some of the inequalities in the labour market uh, and in the workplace is very important going forward. Uh, so that's very much linked to a just transition, not only making sure we have jobs, new jobs, but to make sure they're good jobs and, as I said before, well-paid, rewarding jobs uh, as well. Uh, and we're taking quite an innovative approach in Scotland. So we'll, we don't have all the powers over employment legislation because clearly the UK government has many powers. So what we do is use as much influence as we have as a Scottish government through public expenditure to make sure that we can go for what's called fair work first. So we're giving out public money, we may attach some conditions to that so that the recipients of public funding, they, they have to adhere to some of our, our policies and work with us. So it's very much using what influence we have uh, as a Scottish government. So that's where we are at the moment. Uh, I Clearly in Scotland we have very ambitious targets and we are up there helping to lead the world uh, towards a net zero world. We are co of course are hosting COP26 later this year, so it's a fantastic platform for Scotland uh, and also we want to make sure we're playing our role in, in helping to tackle this agenda uh, going forward. Um. This is amazing. So obviously, um, you will play some kind of role during um, COP26 uh, this autumn, and I do hope it's going to take place. Now, um, thinking about um, the COP and the possibility to exchange experiences with um, so many other um, actors and um, decision makers, how do you actually um, want to make sure that there is mutual learning happening on exactly your portfolio? Because, I mean, it's so unique. And I'm sure you're not just learning from uh, your own Scottish experiences, you're also drawing on other jurisdictions from on other countries um, to get um, inspiration. Um, what would be uh, your message um, to this audience um, when it comes to the sharing of experiences uh, with, let's say, public investment um, for a just and green transition? So at the heart of our climate change legislation in Scotland, we have a commitment to a just transition, so it's part of, of the legislation. And as you will be aware, COP26 has a just transition at the heart uh, of that gathering as well in Glasgow uh, later this year. So we clearly have a big challenge and we are using public funding. We're setting up new funds for new emerging technologies. We have a, a £2 billion low carbon fund in Scotland. Uh, I know I should talk in euros, but it's £2 billion. Uh, and also we've set up a, a new Scottish National Investment Bank and its primary aim is mm. to support our transition to a net zero economy. So that new bank that's been set up publicly run um, has that as its number one aim. So we're using what public funding levers we have and public policy levers we have to go forward. And I do hope that we do have some good events at COP26 where we can share um, our experiences and ideas for the future over just transition. Um, as I said before, I'm clearly this is a new position in the Scottish Government and I'm honoured to be the, uh, the first holder of this new ministerial post. So, you know, we've got a lot of learning to do going forward. We're working with our, our universities in Scotland. We've got world leading universities in Scotland and uh, we've got a lot of intellectual capital uh, as well as a good, uh, you know, good private sector. So, you know, we're trying to do this in a partnership approach and every other day in the news in Scotland are more and more companies and public sector organisations committing themselves to net zero and laying out their plans of how they're going to adapt radically to the new future. So there's a lot of momentum behind this agenda and I hope that COP26 will reflect that momentum and there will be some events, uh, you know, looking at the just transition and just to make sure that Scotland's playing our role uh, to make sure that's on the agenda in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to, lot to be done. That's wonderful. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, just one comment and one last question, because I do know that I've you need to minutes. leave. Okay, yep. Oh, that's wonderful. Excellent. Um, now, let's just hope that um, if anyone believes that the, the climate negotiations are not going in the right direction, um, which I'm sure will not be the case, um, 
in Glasgow. Uh, let's invite everyone to have a look at uh, Scotland and how things are being implemented um, as we are speaking. That's really encouraging. Now, um, the question I will ask all panelists uh, towards the end um, of uh, uh, the session is, uh, well, the one I want to ask you now, and that's um, what, in your opinion, should actually be the first three points on the climate agenda in the 2020s for a just and net zero world? So what three actions would you like to see going forward to bring about um, a just and green 2020s and beyond? So myself, yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's a very good question. And, you know, we, we, we do have to focus on outcomes and we have to make sure that we are uh, prioritizing what we want to see happen. I think in terms of the three things I would want to see happen, firstly, I think as a, as, as a world community, we have to revisit what we see as valuable. And clearly there's a huge debate over well-being and uh, the, you know, the definition of economic growth. Uh, so we, we have to reappraise what as, as, as human beings we see as valuable and move away from just measuring a country's success on GDP or GNP uh, and that economic growth, traditional definition of economic growth. So I think that's really important, it's redefining what we see as valuable. Um, secondly, clearly you said at the beginning uh, that we're facing a lot of challenges at the same time. We've got a changing world economy. We now have a commitment to a net zero society. And of course, we now have the COVID crisis and the impact of COVID. And so my second point would be that as we rebuild after COVID, that we use that as a catalyst to do things differently. And clearly, good quality green jobs uh, and, and, and other issues we have to have at the forefront of our minds as we're rebuilding the world economy, and, and in my case, the Scottish economy, uh, after COVID. So that we use that as a catalyst, as a platform to get towards a net, net zero society. Um, and I guess the third aim would be that given that COP26 is coming to Glasgow, that we recognise that this is a global ambition for climate change. It's a global issue, clearly. It's, it, Scotland's lucky enough to be hosting this. It's got to be very inclusive and we have to make sure that there's representatives from the Global South whose voices are heard and listened to. And therefore that, uh, that global approach, one of fairness and global justice, and climate justice is really, really important. And clearly COP26 is a, is a major platform for that as well. So that'd be my three points. Well, um, wonderful. Thank you so very much, um, Minister. Thank you for taking um, time this afternoon. Um, and I know you've got a busy schedule and if you um, disappear in the next few minutes, no one will be um, surprised. I did prioritise this conversation with you so we could um, max out um, the time we yeah. have with you. Now, well, thank, you any further... <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure There's the a other... climate change debate in Parliament, so I've got to go and vote on that. It's a climate change debate. <laughs> so thank you, you very much. I'll have to leave you there. You certainly do. Thank you so much. Thank and um, I would um, definitely hope that um, our, an our other panelists, our other guests um, today, uh, will come back to some of the few things, uh, some of the things we've just heard. But now I really need to introduce you um, to our two other wonderful speakers. There is uh, Dale uh, Mediaris. Uh, he has been, or he, he was, uh, with the UN, US Environmental Protection Agency for over 20 years. Um, you were at the Office um, of International Affairs. So you've got a fantastic background um, for this discussion this afternoon. You know about um, global uh, developments um, in the environmental space and how cooperation is working or isn't working. But now for over a decade, um, you have been with the uh, Northern Virginia Regional Commission and you are co-leading um, on the Commission's Regional Climate Mitigation, Resilience and International Programs. So you obviously also understand uh, the regional agenda and how um, climate policy is being implemented on the ground. That's super exciting. Um, our fourth person on the panel today is uh, Majid Majid. Um, and because um, you came on board in the very last minute, thank you so much for that. Um, I looked you up on the internet and I saw that your website is actually called Magic Majid. So um, I have great expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to what you have to... Oh, we lost connection to Majid. Um, that's unfortunate. Um, so if Majid is not 
back in the next um, 15 seconds or so. Let's hand over um, to Dale. And I would like to ask you something very similar um, that I just asked um, the minister. I would like to understand um, from your day-to-day -day work how you are trying to implement a green transition, a just transition. Um, so from a European point of view, I'm not entirely sure what the tools, the policies are that uh, you have um, at hand to make a green and just transition um, happening. So why don't you tell, tell us a little bit about how public investment in the US is used to address climate, uh, the climate and biodiversity crisis, while also um, tackling the challenges of a just transition where you work. Over to you. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. First, I just want to say a special thanks to the Heinrich Bull Foundation for inviting me to be part of this discussion. It's it's really it's a huge privilege. Um, thanks to you, Sabrina, also for moderating the panel. Um, the answer to the first question is, um, in a sense, simple, but maybe insufficient. Um, we're a public agency of the Commonwealth of Virginia. We represent 13 local governments uh, in size from eight, nine, 10,000 people all the way to a million, 300 million, 400,000, like Fairfax County. And we have a small secretariat that oversees um, a range of climate and sustainability initiatives. And for the past 20 years, we've been working diligently on climate, on sustainability projects. But in the context of this um, event, working with Europe, we have developed a really, really special business model um, about learning and applying lessons concerning renewable energy, green infrastructure, stormwater, green buildings from cities like uh, Bottrop, from regions like Stuttgart, Hamburg and Berlin, other European cities as well, and then applying them. So um, public investment in the form of our agencies being used um, to help accelerate Probably some of them, uh, you know, 20 years ago, nobody was talking about climate change at the local level, or there was very, very little, um, uh, or, 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 or um, not insufficient, but levels of activity. And all of a sudden, people are talking about it all the time. And it's now recognized how important the role of cities are in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, um, promoting resiliency plans, uh, while at the same time um, promoting sustainable, resilient infrastructure, social inclusion, um, and addressing public health. So the short answer to the question is, is that uh, as a public agency, our work um, in the context of this, this conversation with counterparts from Europe is very special because we have a, a very long track record of taking green buildings, green rooftops, um, renewable energy policies from pioneering cities in Europe and actually applying them to places like the city of Alexandria um, in Arlington County. And that's really, really important too because um, the efforts of the past couple of years at the local level, which our region I think is represented uh, almost as a model, places like Fairfax and Arlington County were, were, were co-initiators of the Cool Counties Initiative, for instance, which was one of the very first climate initiatives ac across the United States at the local level. Um, and that's what sustained a lot of climate and energy and sustainability policies, uh, especially for the period between 2017 and 2021. And now as the federal government starts to catch up, they're, they're able to work with some really, really impressive programs and we're able to match that now with this less learning from, from pioneering regions and cities in Europe. Uh, this is amazing and it's also really heartening. It's something that's also um, appeals to me because in my day job I'm the executive director of SDSN Sustainable Development Solutions uh, Network uh, Germany and this is exactly um, what the enti entire endeavor is all about. How can we exchange best practice experiences? How can we exchange um, solutions across the world. And if I can come back to you on this um, just for a second, um, what are the institutions, the networks, the frameworks that you draw on in order to make this exchange of best practice um, and experiences possible? 
So speaking just within the context of Northern Virginia, I mean, I think it would be helpful to sort of highlight uh, where we were 20 years ago. Um, and international collaboration was, I think, even further behind than local level sustainable sustainability and, and climate initiatives. Um, there was, I think, um, lots of activity, um, but very little coordination, and I think little consideration about how in the U.S. local government, a city, a town, a county, a region, a state works, there was very little thought about what comes out of it. I mean, a Americans were sort of used to, an, um, you know, if you had a, a partnership with a city uh, around the world, sort of a meet and greet event was sufficient. But I think we've evolved beyond that. And we're at the point now where there's um, uh, appreciation, especially over the last six months, where the Biden-Harris administration has placed a lot of emphasis on um, an initiative called the Foreign Policy for Middle Class. For me, that's code for how do we make international engagement relevant to the man on the street, to the local level? Because if you're talking about the future of NATO, if you're talking about OSCE, you're not going to get a lot of people's attention, certainly not that of a mayor, uh, a wastewater treatment engineer, the head of a, a, a local environmental NGO, um, or a school teacher. Um, we need to find ways in which, as Americans, I'm speaking in a unique cultural context, appreciate and understand the importance and, and, and need to, to engage globally. And so all of a sudden, there's lots and lots of talk, um, especially over the last four years, beginning at the Paris COP, on the role of cities. But I think what we're finding now is, is that talk is great. How does talk translate into action? How does a mayor, when he's engaged with counterparts abroad, take ideas and implement them? And so a business model that we've developed over the past 20 years and put into place is really unique. And I think it could become not just a, um, a statewide, but maybe a national model. And that model is basically focused on we learn. We put ourselves in the position of learners, um, understanding, understanding that we're behind other countries when it comes to renewable energy, uh, although we're catching up very quickly, um, when it comes to um, open space preservation that is uh, part of a comprehensive resiliency initiative for flood mitigation or urban heat island, adding into that layers of social inclusion and economic development. So the, the first core principle of our activity is when we engage internationally, it's with the purpose of learning, nothing else. It's to learn and apply lessons. And then second, we try to prioritize the countries with which we work. And those are the countries that offer us innovations, cities like Stuttgart, Berlin, Boltrup is a phenomenal example with their innovation city of um, of projects that we've actually um, learned from and applied in this region. Um, and then we also stay focused just on a handful of countries that are also not only innovators of climate and sustainability, but are invested in our region. So they're invested economically. There's trade dollars, there's investment dollars, and that's a powerful filter that helps us stay focused just on a couple of countries so that we don't get scattered all over the place attending events we realize the first and foremost purpose of a local official, the residents, the man on the street, if they engage internationally, is to figure out ways in which we help them. And then third, we bring in our region's academic, our region's universities, um, science, commercial businesses, chambers, governmental partners, to help us with this process, get them engaged, see that this is a strategically structured activity it's going to benefit, benefit them. So at the bottom line, it's always about learning and benefits and outcomes. And I, it's, it's intuitively pretty obvious that this is how it should be, but it's not how it's always been done. And so that's what makes our work really, really unique. And I can share with you later some examples of how it's actually um, played out. And it's quite exciting. And it's even more fun to think about how this could be carried out in the future. Well, um, thanks so much uh, for sharing all of this, Dale. Uh, it's so exciting. Um, yeah, you say uh, learning um, benefit, benefits outcomes this is obviously what the PGS uh, is all about. And uh, if we can create networks, despite the fact that we only meet online, that will be um, such, um, such an 
add-on benefit. So um, hopefully that's going to be the case. Now, I decided to stick with you for a minute longer um, because I understand from our technical team that we lost at least one participant. Um, who else is um, online right now? Okay, so um, Alan, it's, uh, it's great to connection with you. <laughs> it's, uh, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it's live. Um, so Nevertheless, we will manage. <laughs> Because you have been working on transatlantic relations uh, for a long time. You understand about um, engaging the other side of Atlantic. Uh, you have just um, described what a future agenda for transatlantic relations um, should look like. Now, what do you make of what we've just heard uh, from Dale? Um, is uh, this actually something that a Green Party Foundation could, um, could actually be uh, involved in? And is this something, most importantly, um, that has potential for civil society to engage in? Um, what I understand from Dale is um, we need to make this agenda relevant um, to citizens. So um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've got lots of ideas on how we can do that. Absolutely. I was uh, uh, quite um, excited about what Dale was, was talking about, b because for years we have been trying to bring people together who work on change in, uh, on the local level. And um, uh, Virginia was a part of it. And um, so I, 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 I was, uh, yeah, it was really good to hear and sometimes I thought, okay, we do have to learn as ourselves a lot. It's not only an American or an U.S. task to, to, to put your, oneself in the position of uh, learners, but this should be also our position. And I would like to, um, uh, to, to make a link to the corona crisis. We do have a discussion about... Um, the measures we all of a sudden were able to take, and I think this is a very big field of learning. I uh, give an example that in Berlin, um, we uh, last year we established pop-up uh, bike lanes in order to, uh, to 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 give room for people who can who, who could not or were not able or were not willing because of the pan pandemic. Um, to use the, the the public transport and who don't want or to, who don't have a car or who don't want to use the car to make r room on the street for them and this i mean this net would, would wouldn't have happened if we didn't uh, if there wasn't the crisis so um i think we we have lots uh, lots of things uh, to learn and that's why i, I love this uh, this idea of uh applying learning and applying these lessons and, uh, uh, and, and from my point of view it's the, the very important and we have seen during the trump era when the u.s uh, uh stepped back from from the paris agreement what happened uh, the 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 states baden württemberg and california or cities they uh, 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 went on with their cooperation and so they, 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 they hold up with, uh, with this uh, very important um, exchange on the communal level, which of course, of course needs the boost of, of the national level. Uh, uh, but but um, nevertheless, it, the uh, climate change that a policy uh, are uh, to feel and to, to experience on the local level and this is where people get involved and this is where um where people yeah got also com committed to, uh, to to the things especially in terms of uh of of, of uh, traffic and mobility this is uh, one important uh, uh area of course and another one is i uh, i gave this example in the in my uh, um, opening remarks another one is uh, being a share uh, or t having a share on, on in the uh, uh, energy transition uh, activities um, we we will have in the future we we won't have any longer this uh, centralized mass power uh, plants but we will have uh, energy producing on a local on a very local uh, re and regional level and that's why it's so important to involve the communities and we do have to exchange uh, a lot of things uh, we are really convinced of, of that 
Thank you, Ellen. You know what, without any further ado, I would like to give this um, back to Dale and uh, hear what you have to say. I mean, is this um, a vision that you share and uh, how realistic is it actually where you work to engage citizens at the level um, that Ellen was just suggesting? As, um, it, it's not as easy, I think, as I, I, I wish it were, but um, I mean, you've got to start somewhere. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that if um, local governments, if climate, if all the, if this perfect storm is as threatening as I believe and agree you portrayed it at the beginning, it's not just climate, it's the economy, it's the public health, it's social exclusion, um, it's, it's, it's the, all the legs of the sustainable development stool. If, if they are unstable, everything's going to come apart. And so we need to address these systemically. Moreover, if, um, if global engagement is so vital, then we're going to have to figure out how we make global engagement work. And you're going to have to have a plan. And a plan's going to depend upon priorities mm. and filtering out first what you do versus over the short term over what you do over the long term. And so um, for me, the problem involved with local governmental issues and sustainability, even when I was at the government for so long, the, the problem is, is that, as I referred earlier, um, Americans just aren't naturally inclined, at least in the present, last 30, 40, 50 years, to, um, to learn. I mean, it, there's been learning, but it hasn't been systemic, structured, or purposeful, and so um, the, the 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 answer to your question, uh, Sabrina, is uh, it hasn't been easy. It's a learning process unto itself to say, look, if local government is important in terms of um, promoting sustainability, reducing, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, making sure that there's uh, equitable housing, employment opportunities, access to services. Um, and uh, we're globally engaged, let's see how we make those two very, very dynamic, complex pieces fit together. And so for me, the logic was, okay, and the simplest, um, and, and for other parts of the region too, I mean, Charlotte, North Carolina is doing a lot of formal lesson learning, the other local governments too that are doing this. But it was, it was simply practical. It's um, how do we start simply with a process amidst all the problems, all the countries of the world. And so for us, it was, okay, we have to learn, we have to have outcomes, because the cynics all look at international collaboration and they say, yeah, it's just a trip. Those guys, they go and they have a, a, a beer in the beer garden and then they come back and how's that gonna help us with renewable energy or waste collection or electric vehicle infrastructure or workforce training. And so the way we work, is to try, try to provide an answer to that. We have these problems on climate mitigation, on energy efficiency, on renewable energy, on um, stormwater management and flooding. Boy, Stuttgart is certainly a leader on green rooftops, on you know, like the fresh luft noise of the clean air corridors. Um, common sense says, let's figure out how we take those innovations and apply them to things that are really important to us. And the more that we've started to uh, look back on the successes that we've had, uh, a regeneration plan, for instance, for a distressed watershed, uh, the more we realize, especially by taking green infrastructure lessons, we're awakening more and more to the, the, um, the economic value, but also the social inclusion value. This distressed watershed where we're taking lessons from architects from Berlin, from Stuttgart, done some work in the Ruhrgebiet. Um, th these are really pu powerful public spaces. They're, they're thriving. And they're in some of the most demographically diverse parts of, of, of our region. And so it's a win-win-win situation for us. We take ideas about green rooftops, apply them to one of the most diverse, largest high schools in the Commonwealth, and it's an educational instrument. We take lessons about on-site stormwater management. We apply them to a stormwater or a, a, a watershed restoration plan. It creates a beautiful park. People visit it, um, and it's um, 
a thri it's 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 it, it's it's more ec economically relevant um, as a, a, a part of our city or of our region than before. Everything just adds up. So it's this investment in learning from you about green infrastructure, applying it formally, making sure that there are outcomes, and then hopefully the public begins to awaken and see, oh my gosh, when we work with our counterparts across the pond in Germany, we learn, we benefit, we profit. It's as simple as that. I really love it. Thank you. Um, I would actually also love you to share with us a case study, like something that you've learned in very practical terms um, that you've then implemented. So if I were a citizen um, from, uh, you know, from your region um, and I asked you, what is it actually that you do for, the, for, for, for me, for, for um, the citizens um, around here? What would you tell them? And um, before you do that, let me just... Um, uh, share this one thought I have. You were mentioning um, Stuttgart and uh, the issue of clean air. Now, Stuttgart for a very long time, and you will obviously notice, um, was um, one of the cities was really bad air quality, um, not least to do with air pollution uh, due to um, the exhaust um, from um, diesel cars. This has changed and um, it has changed because of civil society action, because of litigation um, by civil society organizations. And I'm just mentioning this because it shows how everything needs to play together. So if a city um, government can't act or doesn't want to act, or there's simply not enough people who want to act, then sometimes civil society is uh, the force um, that can make um, all the difference. But now over to your example. So I'm a citizen from your region. Uh, what do you tell me? What have you done for me? Yeah, so I'll just give you an example. Um, in 2009, I left the EPA um, in late 2008, early 2009. And there were fewer than 500 kilowatts, that's with a K, of um, solar photovoltaic installed uh, across the state uh, and region. And um, through the um, you know, collaborations with our um, local businesses, with our local governments, with the universities, this really exceptional program focusing on, on, on solar PV grew. And out of that, um, or a, a piece of that conversation was the work that the Stuttgart region had done on the climate atlas, identifying um, a whole range of environmental renewable energy assets. And so that was the inspiration for um, a map that we've adopted into our own solar PV programs. And so um, just to give you a sense of the scale of, of how profound the, um, the, uh, the, the, the change has been between 2019 and 2020, um, almost 1.4 gigawatts of solar have been installed in Virginia. Now put that into context. In 10 years, the state's gone from 277 kilowatts to almost 1.4 gigawatts. Now, our work was a very, very small piece of that, but it reflects again how we worked with drawing lessons from Stuttgart and then the creation of our own solar mapping initiative was a partnership with our region's largest university, George Mason University. And that's another core component of how we collaborate because we're a small agency. There's only 16, 17, 18 of us. And I'm not a specialist in a whole range of energy topics, but there are many people at the universities and the businesses and other local governments with whom I can work that are intimate with the technical, the, the policy aspects of what's going on in Germany on renewable energy, and then can help us adopt these lessons. So to the skeptic, I would say, um, if you thought things weren't working for you in 2009 in terms of this process, look how much things have changed over the past decade because of the fidelity that we have paid to this lesson learning work. And so um, that's one small example. Um, the other would include that which I referred to earlier where um, we received a government grant to 
help restore a distressed watershed. We took over experts or brought over experts with um, uh, um, stormwater management, green infrastructure, green rooftops, um, put them in local charrettes and design programs and planning activities. The ideas transferred and many found applications. And for a while, um, not just Northern Virginia, but the greater Washington area was, um, this is about 10 years ago, was the largest concentration of green rooftops in the US. So here you have, again, um, skeptics raising honest questions. Why do we need to learn? It's because we have this problem with stormwater or with renewable energy. There's cities and regions across the Atlantic that do things better than we do. We put together teams of experts on this side, invite counterparts from Germany, other European countries to come and help us. And then we sustain the conversation. We weren't satisfied with just one event. We strung together multiple events so that we would drive towards some kinds of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's um, a really, really important um, example on which our future work is going to be based and premised. It definitely is. Um, now, I was just thinking when I was listening to you, um, we, I mean, I'm part of the crowd of policy wonks. We, the policy wonks, we talk about transformational change. Sometimes we're not entirely sure what it actually means, but you've just uh, really nailed it. Um, so, um, Alan, you're with us on the phone, right? Yes, and you've I am. Been, and you've been listening. Now, this is, uh, this is your topic now. Um, civil society, transformational change, and a... Um, green and just future in the 2020s. Um, can you share any experiences um, as well where you feel that there has been real change on the ground thanks to the action of uh, maybe some actors uh, that, not, that are not the usual suspects? <laughs> yeah, um, it, what I'm fascinated, and fascinated about, and this would also be a question to, to Dale, um, uh, we see that within big cities like uh, Berlin, we have to manage uh, heat and and drought and 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 uh, and so on. Uh, with some, we we do need data, and there are some initiatives uh, on their way to um, to to uh, foster. Uh, public data so that they can be used to establish smaller business models or to establish information for initiatives who want to, um, for instance, who want to do water management for the trees in the city or so. This is every summer we do have some calls to, uh, um, to, to bring water to the trees. And um, and this is a, a point I'm really interested um, in how this works in the U.S. We have recently we, we heard uh, Francesca Bria, perhaps you know her from Barcelona, and they have established this system w together with the civil society that the city shares its data so that uh, people are enabled to um yeah to 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 take things into their own hand and they do have uh yeah they do have fun with it with it and it's effective um so and we try to establish things like that in berlin and um uh, uh and, but this is difficult because the broadband infrastructure in germany isn't uh, as it should be but from <laughs> my point of view uh, this is uh, essential for, um, uh, for for effectful uh, climate measures, especially on the local level. And so my question to today would be, how is there, uh, uh, are there any public data, uh, climate data, weather data, or uh, public data that, that can be used by the citizens in order to uh, to make a plan and to take uh, an initiative to, uh, to, to the to different issues. I mean, we, you talked about um, mobility, you talked about uh, storms and, and uh, uh, water floods and so on. Yeah, the, the answer I, is... Before I hand over oh, to sorry. you, um, just one moment um, for everyone um, in the audience. You might have been wondering why um, Majid is not with us um, in this virtual room any longer. Well, actually, his fire alarm went off and he had to evacuate. 
Um, it's not like his um, internet connection broke off, but um, he had to leave the building. Um, that's really unfortunate, but I hope we can somehow make up for this and PGS is on again next year um, as well, I'm sure. Dale, over to you. I was going to say that, um, Ellen, there's actually a, um, a very, very wonderful demonstration in Washington, D.C. of how Berlin's green area ratio the, a data-driven process for identifying where green infrastructure projects, you know, you, you would say things like you know, get applied in courtyards or, or tree plantings. Um, and it's been adopted through, a, um, in Washington, D.C., in partnership with George Washington University and a colleague of mine um, uh, at, the, at the School of Geography. And it's a, what, at the end of this webinar, I'll send both you and Sabrina and also the Bull Stiftung a, a link to the work. Because my understanding is, is that the data-driven process of identifying where um, green plans get established and in what dimensions for the district are linked to broader data points concerning stormwater, urban heat island mitigation, um, and other relevant ph phenomena. And um, the, 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 the parallel or the, the, the other answer to your question is, is that my understanding is, is that most local governments have pretty good data, although this could be wrong, um, about pretty fundamental um, climate mitigation efforts, applications of renewable energy. There's a lot of citizen science um, initiatives in most larger cities in the United States tracking um, not just uh, environmental phenomena, you know, heat incidences, um, storm incidences, but they're linking it now with greater regularity to um, social inclusion, social exclusion initiatives, which communities um, uh, of marginalized, uh, that are most marginalized are also most vulnerable to urban heat island, or stormwater, and all these data layers are coming together. Um, our, our own agency has been doing this for our region, and be happy to share with you some some links to that. It's it's um, it's it's pretty substantive and really really growing. Yeah, um, Ellen, I'm sure you'd take Dale up on his offer. Pardon? I'm sure you you're going to take Dale up on his offer to share um, some more. Uh, uh, yes, inspirational data with absolutely. you. That's great because that's also something that um, PGS is supposed to be doing even though it's happening in the virtual realm uh, this year. Um, we need to get to know each other and find out what everyone is good at, what kind of information everyone has and then uh, put it at the service of um, a common vision. And actually, because we're slowly coming uh, to the end of the session, I would like to go back to this idea of um, a common vision and essentially ask the two of you um, the same question that I asked the minister beforehand. Um, and if you may remember, um, it's about your view of the three things that need to happen on the climate agenda in the 2020s in order for a just and net zero world to come about. So three policy items or three, let's call them transformational changes that uh, you would like to see um, happening so we can have this um, green and just future in Europe, in the US and elsewhere in the world. Um, perhaps, um, Ellen, because uh, you started, I also give you the last word, if that's fine. And um, I mm -hmm. ask you, Dale, to come up with your three ideas. Should I go first or would... Uh, Please, yeah. uh, oh, sorry. Um, I, I like to repeat the, the three core parts of how we engage on sustainability climate um, uh, in, in, in an international context, which is um, local governments are thrust now like never before under the global stage in the United States. Um, it's important for them to be strategic. And I think being strategic begins with learning. You can't every city in the world and every issue involving climate or sustainability, you have to prioritize. So put yourself in the position as Americans of learners, first and foremost, with the intent 
of applying those lessons from whatever country, whatever city it is. Um, second, the local, in the local governmental context is um, plan outcomes in a context. Um, prioritize the um, issues on which you're working, but define outcomes and then build a long-term plan of engagement so that it's not just constantly a process of talking and or talking at, but listening and then figuring out how the listening translates into action. And then finally, um, our region is going to become stronger as we go forward in this international engagement with counterparts from places like Hamburg and Stuttgart, and Berlin and Munich and Botrop. If we link together our research institutions, our universities, get George Mason, get Virginia Tech to help work with counterparts to make our data centers uh, more sustainable. Northern Virginia is the largest data center market in the world. And so we see lots and lots of opportunities to green the data centers and their operations. They're already doing really well in terms of becoming more energy efficient and drawing from renewables. How can we work with our counterparts in places like Frankfurt, you know, one of the, the data center capitals, through the electrical engineers of our universities to draw from that experience, draw from those lessons and, and apply them. Um, work with the faith-based communities work with the churches, work with the, 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 the schools, help us apply workforce training lessons from the dual system. Um, one of the more exciting, really interesting projects that our agency is working on to learn from Germany is to draw lessons from the memorialization of the Holocaust, how you've interpreted these really wounded public spaces and applied those lessons to places like the city of Alexandria or the town of Leesburg or, or Loudoun County by inviting experts from the topography of terror to help us figure out how we plan, how we interpret um, sites of racial injustice. Um, and that's a really, really exciting example of how the, the social inclusion project has made its way into um, the successes that we've had with the environmental a lot more I could share with, but those are the three uh, examples of projects, but those are the three core components. Learn and apply lessons, make planning strategic uh, at the local level, prioritize countries, prioritize outcomes, even academic, commercial, civil society partners to help us with this business. Convince them that international engagement is not just fluff and travel and events, it has outcomes that benefit everybody. Thank you, Dale. Um, I think we've got a full agenda for the 2020s and I'm sure um, it's not the last time um, that we have um, an exchange on uh, how to implement this. Thank you so much. Um, that's extremely inspiring. We take this on board. Um, Ellen, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I really loved what the minister from Scotland said and also what, what was said now too. And I think it fits perfect together to um, to think about what is valuable um, for uh, for people and and uh, how to um, uh, yeah how to bring back a feeling of well-being uh, as I as far as I understood was this one of his points and the last mentioned point of civic education of course we are as Heinrich Böll Foundation we are an organization of uh, uh, civic education this is at the core of our uh, uh, of our uh, of what we do and uh, so I like this, but I would like to add the the national uh, or the international the transatlantic level. I think all these efforts on the local and communal level and this learning has to be backed by a transatlantic alliance for climate neutrality because uh, only when we establish a joint compensation me mechanism for carbon limits then we will really mitigate the climate uh, change. And so we, we have also to work on the political level, on the, uh, on the level of, um, of, of uh, ma climate foreign policy, mainstreaming the climate policy, not saying, okay, this is uh, uh, one part and what do we have to talk about uh, 10 other points, um, but to say climate foreign policy should be an integral part of strategic foreign policy dimensions into the climate agenda. So 
um, when do we have to take on, a bo on board also the Eastern European states, also states who are de who depend up to now on fossil on the fossil industry. So we 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 have to include them um, into uh, climate negotiations. Into for this should always be on top of the foreign policy agenda. And uh, the more we cooperate between uh, the U.S. and the EU and the states the, or the countries within the EU. Uh, the further we will, uh, the further we will come, and the more uh, people will see uh, that it is worth to work on on climate change. And the uh, the uh, third point I would like to make is what what other uh, um, participants in this panel also uh, stressed. Climate protection is a, a matter of democracy. We 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 can't keep the democracy alive. Um, if we don't manage to uh, to solve the, the climate crisis, because it has effects on social and on democratic uh, uh, status of people and on their everyday lives, and that's why uh, democracies have really to uh, 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 to work uh, together very thoroughly and, and very intensely. And uh, I would say the the coming uh, uh, decade is uh, the is decisive. Either we we manage to to mitigate the climate change, or um, yeah, further or coming generations really have to suffer from the outcome. So I don't want to 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 pay uh, to to paint some apocalyptic uh, picture, uh, but I really want to encourage all of us to do on different levels uh, what we already know. We in Germany we always say we we don't have a. A problem with comprehension. We have a problem to to put things on the ground, and I think now it's time to put things on the ground. Um, thank you, Ellen. Sure, we need um, a sound analysis um, of a situation in order to implement a can-do agenda. Uh, this is uh, what I think all of us get up every morning. So, um, thank you for <laughs> being here. Best of luck for your personal and professional endeavors when it comes to. Um, implementing the transition to a green and just society and economy in the 2020s. Um, so we've, um, we've had a whole span from local politics and from uh, the day-to-day -day lives of citizens uh, up to foreign policy and the global agenda. Um, there's more to come um, on the PGS. Um, stay tuned. Um, enjoy all the lively discussions. Um, I thank uh, everyone who's been uh, here for the session. Thank you very much um, for the speakers. Um, I'm so, so sorry um, that Majid uh, wasn't able to join us. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, he will be uh, back again with all of us next year. Now, um, enjoy your evening and uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank, Thank you, you Alan. It's a real privilege. <laughs> Thank you. And we look forward to hosting you guys in Northern Virginia.